We're going to hear from Shane Whitmore from Caltrans, who's going to uh, talk to us about their quality assurance program. Well, I am Shane Whitmore. I'm a senior equipment engineer for Caltrans, and I run the quality assurance quality control department. And then I have, basically I have, give you an overview, I have a staff of three. Um, they're inspectors, and basically right now I have um, Tom Kashishian and uh, Scott and Herman and basically what they are is they're the, they're the gentleman that actually goes out and look at the equipment. I go with them on occasion. The only reason I put their names up here and, and brought this up is because if you're ever going to do a quality control department or a quality assurance department, the staff that you choose is very important. So you make sure that you get a well-rounded group. So like Tom is a, has been a long-time mechanic, has been in, in the inspection field for over 10 years, um, got a wealth of knowledge. Um, Herman came from a mechanic side, been a mechanic most of his life, knows how to operate equipment, got a Class A license so he can go out and operate equipment. And Scott came from the material management side of the house, so basically he can help us do research. And, and so I have a good, well-rounded team. They work together. So I'm just going to say teamwork matters. So it does matter who you choose. And the nice thing about these guys is they have to travel a lot together, and it's very really important that they all get along. Basically what we have is we have a requirement that's in our SAM manual that basically tells us that all vehicles we inspected for acceptance at the delivery dealer's place of business prior to delivery to the purchasing state agency. The inspection determines all specifications are met and the dealer has performed properly the pre-delivery inspection or PDI and servicing. So I don't know how many people buy equipment but not always that gets done as just even that simply. So we look at a lot of equipment and these are just slides of some of the equipment we look at and the complexities of what we look at. And uh, you'll, you'll know why I give these slides in a minute. Uh, the equipment inspector follows a specific procedure uh, to ensure the items presented by the supplier meet the intended requirements defined by the specification engineer. So we look at all kinds of things. In the picture here, if you'll notice, we were just following this truck and realized the tires are rubbing together. So that kind of told us there's a problem here. Here's another case where we actually go out. We have a set of, we have uh, 10 scales, certified scales, and so we spend a great deal of our time weighing equipment. And it's, if you've ever weighed equipment, you'll know that a lot of what gets manufactured doesn't, isn't necessarily legal. And so we spend a lot of time making sure that the weights work and then we're not liable for those weights. QA inspectors work closely with the specification engineers to ensure that each requirement is met and variations and deviations are clearly documented and recorded. Uh, deficiencies or, description or discrepancies are identified by the inspector, then an inspection report is written and forwarded to the supplier, the materi to material management, and the specification engineer. The specification engineer has the authority to decide what is precisely meant by his or her specification wording. For those that write specifications that you're going to send out to bid, you probably know that it's hard to come up with a specification that meets every intent that you meant for every manufacturer available to bid. So a lot of times we go out there and we actually write up things that <clears throat> may sound like that's okay. We write it up anyway to make sure that we're not misinterpreting the specification that was written. And most people without formal training mistake the concept of quality assurance for the more common term used of quality control. Uh, the Office of Quality Assurance performs both functions. I think it helps to explain both functions. Quality assurance is defined as those planned and systematic operations conducted to ensure that the operation and product meets specifications, purchase orders, change orders, and drawings. In short, inspecting the purchase for conformance to plans and specifications. Quality control is typically an internal process of the manufacturer to ensure the product, commodity, or component is built to the desired dimensions, tolerances, and, com and complete to the quality standards required. Quality control is a central part of the manufacturing process. For those that are buying equipment, you probably know that, one of the, and you've dealt with enough um, purchasing of equipment, that sometimes one of the things that gets cut from a process or a manufacturing process is quality control. We all see the quality control decals on vehicles when we buy them or components, but when you actually go look at it, it's kind of like the quality control sticker on your underwear. It just doesn't really mean a whole lot. Here's an example of when, what we go out and we look at. Manufacturing is, is a tough area for people to manufacture and produce a consistent 
same product all the time it, it because you have so many different people that are manufacturing a product so we run into manufacture problems when we do our inspections all the time quality control can encompass quality circles quality programs quality checklists uh, designed to support a continuous improvement process so we actually we actually when we go out and do our inspections try to figure out what that vendor does for their quality control that helps us determine what we need to look at. Caltrans, we have our own quality standards on fleet identification, electrical, paint and coatings, and welding. And those have to be updated pretty much all the time. We annually look at them to update them based on the fact that the marketplace changes. Some of the items you'll see, you know, we I put a few slides in here, things that we look for, we find. Electrical would be there are no uh, protection boots on the positive terminals, paint, more paint problems. Metal prep is one of our biggest areas that we find with manufacturing that we have to look at because basically most products are manufactured then painted. And a lot of times the metal prep is, you, you can't see it underneath the paint. When we're fortunate enough to find it, we definitely write it up and we make them repaint. And all the stuff you're seeing is brand new. So here's welds that have cracked already. We haven't even got it out of the, their yard yet. Poor welds. We have a lot of documentation that we look through. So we look at the, the purchase order that we get a packet, comes in a purchase order, and we have administrative requirements um, which encompass our inspection process, our technical specifications, truck cabin chassis specification, body and component specifications, uh, usually a questionnaire filled out by the vendor. And we actually make sure that that questionnaire is actually matches the specification. Uh, drawings, product literature, we do a lot of research on, on internet um, or when we go out to an inspection we can actually now, a, a good tool and I'm sure you're hearing it a lot now is a smartphone or a tablet, you can, you can find out a lot about a product or blogs or things like that, so really good to go look at. Bid reviews, build sheets, truck order detail, line setting tickets, they, some people just name it differently, email correspondence, uh, purchase estimate and equipment budget request. So in other words, we look, we have a, just a basic package that comes to us that we have to go through and make sure that um, we're ready to go and do our inspection. We have a multi-layered process to go through and you'll get this in a second. So quality assurance inspection process starts out with where we get involved with design reviews. So initially we and our customers get involved in design reviews um, at the very beginning of the process and determine what we're actually will benefit both us and, and our customers. And then we have a post-award meeting. That means after we, the purchase order's been let and we have now awarded it to a vendor, we have a, a, a meeting to go clear up any details that may be um, something, any questions or anything that we may need to address. And then we also invite our customers to those too. We have an in-process review available to where this may be where the vendor has some questions, usually in manufacturing, things like bodies. Um, we have some in-process reviews and we'll go out there and look to see how they're progressing and if it's going being built as we're looking for. It's also a good process for us to be able to go look for a metal prep prior to painting. Then we also go look at cabin chassis. We do a cabin chassis inspection before they put the body on it, which then generates an inspection report on a cabin chassis. Then we have an engineer's response to that cabin chassis report. Then we have a compliance document where we've accepted that cabin chassis. Uh, then we have a pre-completion of bodies and components that we go out and inspect. Most of what I'm trying to show you is we have a lot of process here. Pre-completion of bodies and component inspection report, pre-completion of bodies and components compliance document, pre-production inspection, pre-performance uh, testing, and I'm gonna get to that here in a minute. Then we finally get down to, after all of that process, we finally get down to the vendor says we're ready for delivery, and so we're gonna go out and take a look at it to make sure that it's ready for us to purchase that starts breeding a whole new section. So usually, to be fair to most of our vendors, other than off-the-shelf equipment like cabin chassis or, or, or not, ca yeah, cabin chassis or uh, light-duty fleet, pickup trucks, sedans, generally speaking, we never successfully complete a pre-delivery inspection on the first time. For vendors that have dealt with us that you know, want us to get it done quickly and get it through the process, it generally doesn't happen. But um, it's, it generates a report that tells them this is what you need to fix uh, before we'll accept it and then we go back uh, when they're ready and we look at it, make sure that it's um, ready for us to uh, purchase initially 
and then um, we, ins uh, we basically issue a compliance document that tells them they can ship it. Generally speaking, after that, it is generally sent to rather our headquarter shop or it's sent to a field location, and when it arrives, we do a final inspection on it. The final inspection is to make sure that in delivery, it complies with several things because there's documentation that's required when it shows up like a weight, California weight cert. There, is, um, there are um, all the registration requirements, the manuals, uh, tools that are supposed to be shipped with it. And there are things like if, if a truck and cabin chassis is gonna have a problem, it's gonna leak on the way when it's gonna be delivered. There's mileage requirements. So we have a lot of things we check on a final inspection. We also, every one of these phases that you see here, we, we give our customers the ability to come and attend. So they're involved in the process all the way through, which gives us greater buy-in when we, when we receive it. So one of our inspection reports looks similar to this. And basically it goes out and it tells them, we go by line by line through specification. We tell them this is what we requested in the specification or in the purchase order. This is what's not compliant. Some of these reports get into the 30 page category, depending on the complexity of the equipment. So we spend quite a bit of time writing reports. And by the way, we'll put in all kinds of stuff. So we, we start putting in pictures and uh, graphs and charts. We wanna make sure that it, they can fully understand what they need to, to correct. In a lot of cases where we have, we'll actually put tape on or green dots that show them where they are and we take pictures of everything. And that's been pretty successful. Uh, we very rarely have a, a re-inspection that goes that I didn't know what I needed to fix. Some con contract specifications require performance tests, such as street sweepers, rotary snowblowers, line grinders, barrier machines, drill rigs, stripers, and boats. That doesn't mean we don't operate every piece of equipment. We do. So when we go out, even when we're doing mass purchasing of uh, sedans and pickups, we will absolutely make sure that everything runs and operates just like it's supposed to. So my guys today are out looking at uh, the remainder of order of uh, basically about 250 Nissan pickups, which means they go through every pickup, make sure that it starts, make sure all the lights and the windows and all those things work, and that's at your basic level. We do have certain specifications that require that we do performance tests, so there is criteria that they have to, they have to meet and performance requirements that they have to accomplish. We set up a test course for, for sweepers, and we, make sh we run them through multiple tests through the, through the um, test course. And we also invite our customers to these also so they can actually come out and see what happens. I I'm gonna get to this in a minute, but I'm just gonna rem remind you to look at the gauges that we have here. So we put some gauges on our equipment, but nowadays with technology, a lot of it can be you know, produced with their onboard uh, telemetry and we get our, our information we need. We do snow blowers, so we'll take a snow blower out and make it go through a, a couple of several test courses, barrier machines, paint stripers, we'll actually make them perform every function that's required by the spec, line grinders, drill machines. Like I said, we use our smartphones so we can do video. If our customers can't attend, we will do, we'll do a FaceTime and take them around the machine as we're doing it. Do boats. So we have actually taken a boat out. The interesting part, I actually had a video for this and when it transferred over, it didn't come in. But ultimately, when we take the boat, this boat out, we took this boat out in, uh, up by Seattle. Basically, what we had to do is take it out with a 3,000 pound block of concrete in the, on the deck and go out and try to swamp it. So we do all kinds of fun stuff. I've not had anybody quit yet, so that's good. And then we'll do, you know, all kinds of inspection, snoopers, breach inspection trucks. My guys have to get up in those platform trucks and not be afraid of height. That's a hard one to get over. It used to be that we would, as Caltrans, we used to uh, put the performance tests on ourselves. So that means we had to go out and get our, usually our maintenance crews to, to find a place with us to go out and test snow blowers, for instance. So we would have to go find snow and then get a maintenance crew to come out and, and groom the course and provide the loaders and in some cases we'd have to truck it in. That's how it used to be. And then here's one of our snow tests. Here's our procedure for our snow test. And so of course we'd have to haul snow in. If we had a, like we've had, we had droughts in California for a while so finding snow was tough to do. And then we'd have to have, a, have the test performed on a state property to have it done for our own liability issues. So as you can see, we generally used to have to make it. 
Well, now what happens is we put it in the contract that the, the supplier or the vendor has to perform the t or provide the location. That opened up a new world. That means that they can select a place. It doesn't have to be in the state of California. It can be anywhere that we have snow now, for instance. And then they can do sweeper tests at their factory instead of doing it, shipping it all the way out to California to have it done. Um, as long as it meets our requirements of our specification for like altitude, for instance, on, on certain product or, or, or certain equipment they were buying, or, um, or it meets our shear factor for our snow density, then we can, we can do it wherever they want to do it. And so that's actually um, helped us a great deal. Plus it removed, we had no way to calculate the amount of expense it cost us to actually put on our own performance tests. We do final inspections, and that's actually something we added most recently. I, I give an example. One of the things that would just happened to us before I left is we'll go out and look at uh, trailers. And so Caltrans has its own wiring requirements, our own wiring plug-in requirement. And so uh, we'll go out and we take our tester to make sure it's wired the way they want it done. And then we sign it off on our pre-delivery. It gets arrives at our, our ship to location and come to find out the wiring doesn't work. Well, but what we've been finding out is, is after we go out there and we wire it our way, to hook it up to the back of their truck and tow it to our facility, they rewire it back their way. Now we have to go back out and do a final to make sure that they revert it back to what we requested in the first place. Things you learn as you go along. <coughs> On the final inspection, we look for you know components, um, manuals and publications, complex you know, equipment such as drill rigs and personnel hoists and blowers, packers, stripers, sweepers, they leak. Uh, that's the bottom line is we get them and after they've been driven, that's when you start finding the hydraulic leaks, the engine leaks, whatever you, you want to find and we make them get them done and repaired before we accept them. Uh, some of the stuff that we're looking for, dead batteries, we actually just ended up getting an order of 17 trucks, every one of those 17 trucks had dead batteries. If we didn't go out and recheck those and make sure we would have been buying batteries, three batteries for each truck. And then we also found out there was a dead short that was causing the batteries to go dead. None of that we would have found and would have become the burden of the, of the ship to location if we hadn't gone back out and done a final inspection. Yeah, I put on here used parts and new parts. When we go out and do our pre-delivery inspection, we will actually photograph everything that, that is supposed to come with the equipment. And I, I gotta tell you, I, after we deliver it, it, those parts go to a ship to location. And on a number of occasions, we've actually gone out, opened up those parts, and found out that they are not the parts we took pictures of. I'll, le I'll leave it at that. Those are, those are some of the things that we've been able, a actually able to uh, eliminate. Then, of course, there's shipping damage. Uh, we most recently have had a, quite a few little issues that have popped up. One of the things we find a lot of times is uh, manufacturers that provide us um, like we'll buy a large amount of loaders or graders or uh, you know things like that, and what'll end up happening is is when um, the company gets those together, they have more items on them than we requested, so they'll take them off, and then they'll give them to them, and that's perfectly fine. The problem is is the machine now with the with the electronics on it still says that attachment is on there, and it shows up as a diagnostic code. We've actually had. We, we absolutely check these, and then when they go into delivery, we check them again because we found that as they're being delivered, they generate diagnostic codes. I'm sure most manufacturers will tell you that they're having a, a lot of fun trying to get all the different manufacturers of components electronically to sync together. They, they definitely have some battles to overcome. It's not uncommon for us that after we receive a piece of equipment at a delivery location, that it then turns around and goes right to a dealership to get the diagnostic codes de dealt with. So we have leaks. Come to find out on this, this actual order, they pulled the dipstick out to add a component. When they put it back in, they missed the seal on the, on the dipsticks. We have parts fall off. Bolts come loose, they fall off. Hydraulic leaks, fault codes, so our customers, who are our customers? Our customers are the end users, the equipment managers, the operators, the supervisor, the operators, the shop superintendents, the supervisors, the mechanics that have to work on them. They're all, we consider them all our customers. Their basic involvement, they have the ability to be involved through the entire process. And we found that it really helps. Um, sometimes when you've already let a contract 
and then you get a customer comes over, a customer will want something different. And it's kind of hard to change that when you already have a purchase order let and you already have a contract. But the good news is you can now take that back to the specification engineer. They can incorporate that, those improvements or those desires into hopefully the process for the next purchase. Uh, benefits of customer involvement, design approval, approved relationships. I uh, can't tell you how many times we've delivered a piece of equipment and by the time a piece of equipment gets delivered, the people that are receiving the piece of equipment have no idea what they're getting and then they're very resistant or not happy with what they're getting. So now when we get them involved, they know what they're getting before they receive it and they have involvement in what they purchased. And so it gets better buy-in. And then we get our, we get our feedback, um, which we weren't getting before. Product improvement. In this particular case here, we had a customer came out to one of our inspections and he said, basically, he cannot get, when he originally came out and looked at the truck, he says, I can't reach the sign I need to read, reach uh, with this truck. And I said, well, let's try it. So we actually made what he needed to get done, put him up in the bucket, hung a rope from it, measured it off, and by the time he got done, he was like, this will work. And so a lot of it is just removing the impressions or the thoughts, the negative thoughts of something that won't work. The bottom line is they got the buy-in, they were happy with it. Another benefit is any inspection process is, there's no perfect inspection process. There is only improving the odds. So every time we have another set of eyes looking at something, we're improving uh, the quality of the product. That doesn't mean we're going to get everything, but it does mean we're catching more and more each time to where a, a less defects that when we receive them. To touch on that for a minute, everything that we catch now improves downtime. So when a truck shows up or, or a piece of equipment shows up at a yard, instead of it immediately going out to be repaired or sitting waiting on batteries to be done, we don't accept it until all those items are done. So then the burden is not ours. Our old truck is still in service. The new truck is not accepted until all those repairs are done, which means basically we got increased uptime, job still gets done, and there's no negative connotation about the piece of equipment when it arrives. When they come out and they look at it, we get an extra set of eyes. So in this particular case, we put an operator on this truck, ran the boom out, come to find out one of, the, one of your wear pads inside this boom was actually missing. And you can see it did damage to the boom. Probably without going through that, all that operating, we'd have never found that until we'd already accepted it. Off the shelf, there's a lot of desire for a lot of people to go out and buy off the shelf. A lot of, lot of advantages to it. We're not redesigning anything, improves manufacturing time, gives us the ability to go buy something off their showroom floor without having to redesign it. So one of the things that we do in, in QA is we actually take the off the shelf and try to put it into some practical terms that meets our requirements. Here's an off the shelf trailer that you can see where you step up on is nowhere near any grab handles, but that's the way they produced it. And so we were able, most of the vendors that we deal with are more than willing to see the common sense of it and move it. And they did in this particular case, they moved the, the step further back. Off the shelf has its has its limitations. One of the things we have with off-the-shelf too is a problem is uh, if you have your own safety programs in your state, you probably know that you can rent a piece of equipment, use it, but the moment you buy it, it's no longer safe. That happens all the time. A lot of times we have to go when we go to buy off-the-shelf is bring and try to work with the vendor to bring it to our safety requirements to keep it in so we don't end up fighting that battle when we get them. We deal with quite a bit. Actually, we go to a California Prison um, Authority and we go in Solano Correctional Facility and they produce a lot of our uh, four yard, 10 yard beds, bodies, cone, cargo bodies, plows, accessories, frames and racks. And the PIA uh, basically has the first right of refusal to produce those items. We had a lot of problems with PIA about five years ago where they had a long standing history of poor metal prep. I, let's just say that. Nobody was checking the, the, the metal prep prior to paint or prior to putting on the primer. And so we basically changed that. 
But anyway, uh, they, had put, they didn't have a quality control. Their metal was stored outside, which means you know darn well we were getting metal scale. They had a limited sandblasting facility. Basically, they could take the back half of a body and put it in and sandblast if they did that at all. They were working from drawings, no specifications. They were not following our quality standards. And then there was the fun part of to get access to this prison facility meant you had to walk through the general population. So if anybody's ever been to a prison in general population, it's hard to get people to want to go do that. They also have fixed work schedules. They don't work overtime. They only work four days a week. I hate to use the word captive audience, but they have a captive group of people that basically want to work there most of the time. And then, of course, if they have a lockdown, we're just hard to put a, hard to put a timeline on all of this, but they do a pretty good job, but we, we, these are obstacles we have to deal with. We went out there and worked with PIA. So now, basically, it used to be in the past, they would build something, ship it to our, our headquarters shop. If we had a problem with it, we'd have to turn around, ship it back to them to have them done. So we worked out a process with them to where we don't have to go through general population. We go back through the back gate, which is closest to their manufacturing facility. So now I have greater access of people wanting to go. And they go in, and we get to go in and look at them. So we do m multiple inspections, starting with the base bare metal vehicle or body or whatever we're having built and then we go out and make sure that they've done their metal prep we measure their primer thickness and their paint thickness and so the, the product in that respect has uh, greatly improved the communications gotten better and that was another problem we had uh, now we've given them a uh, complete copy of the specification specification engineers now are actually going out to the facilities uh, that's been a great improvement and the reality of it is they actually do want to provide a quality product I mean, I, and I honestly believe that. They bend over backwards. We don't have to fight them to get something changed or improved or fixed. Some of the obstacles we have, so I, I showed you the, the staff I have in the very beginning of this, and then meanwhile, we're buying everything that comes out new technology all the time. And we're generally the first per people for the division of equipment that actually get to see this equipment. The expectation is, is that when we show up at this location, we know all about it and we know how to operate it, we know how all the technology works, and the reality of it is we don't. Fortunately enough, um, one of our requirements is that we have a factory authorized representative on site to show us how the equipment works, walks us through it, and we have to do some of our background work prior to going to those inspections to make sure we know what we're looking at. But it, keeping up with new technology, a lot of times a product is produced before the, before the training is ready or the technology or the manuals are there for us to even read. Then we have to deal with uh, inspection delivery surges. Those on budget, of course, know that how the budget cycles work and not everything comes to you spread out through the entire year. You have to basically deal with those surges and kind of try to figure out how to spread it out to where you're busy all the time. Communication, I, you know, I hear it all the time. Communication's the hardest thing to get uh, accomplished. I don't know if it's ever gonna be resolved. Yeah, it's just a constant battle. A lot of times we'll submit a purchase order or a, a contract out and not everything is read in the contract and even though we try to do a post-award meeting, not everything gets read. And so a lot of times when I say you ought to do a pre-delivery inspection, can't get it through uh, the first time, it's because a lot of it is, oops, I didn't read that. And we have to kind of remind them and we do try to remind them, hey, are you reading the entire spec? To understand this. Our inspection report basically reminds them to read the spec. One of the things we've also found is a lot of manufacturers have eliminated their quality control department. The uh, next deal is they want us to come out and perform their quality control for them. That's not what we're intended to do, but we end up doing a lot of it for them. And then, of course, manipulation of late delivery charges um, is, a, is an obstacle for us. We try to get a qualified uh, supplier uh, to show us how to operate the equipment. Um, no offense to salesmen, but a lot of salesmen don't always know how a piece of equipment works. And then travel. Uh, we travel a lot. For those that travel, you know how much of an obstacle that can be. Um, we try to schedule five days a week. That only works as long as you can get back from the place you just went to. And so if anybody's had a canceled flight, uh, that can, so when, when we schedule an inspection, for instance, we have all these people gonna show up Meanwhile, we're in Southern California or we're out of state and we can't get back. So that causes some, some problems. But So some improvements we've made uh, um, basically are quality standards. We try to improve those all the time. Warranty work, we've tried to eliminate warranty work by making sure that we catch it ahead of time. We go look for recalls. 
Uh, we look at blogs ahead of time to make sure that we're catching anything that we need to catch before it gets delivered. Uh, latent defects. We actually help our customers with uh, defects that are found after it's already put into service if we have the ability to work with our vendors and get those accomplished, and, and frankly we do. We've limited it down to a one point of contact, that would be me, so that way we don't have all that communication confusion, uh, so that's helped. Uh, greater customer involvement, uh, customer notification of upcoming inspections, uh, we work with our headquarters shop uh, to correct efficiencies prior to shops receiving equipment to reduce uh, sh their shop workload. We have modifications that are done to equipment that get kind of expensive so we've actually taken on going out and looking at the quality control of that of those major modifications and that's helped too. We're always purchasing new tools. That's another thing that we're constantly having to do technology changes and so we now have new we need to have new tools to be able to measure new equipment. Hold suppliers accountable while maintaining a good working relationship requires them to provide what they bid for with a smile. That gets a little tough sometimes. Additional functions that we perform, we do inventory of parts and components. So we now do spot checks of um, parts that we used to just basically receive in large quantities. We'll do spot checks, plow blades, uh, lights, things like that. We do uh, weight projects, so we've actually, with our scales, we've actually gone out and done uh, weight programs on, on trucks that later in life we found we may have a, an issue with weight. We put, perform paint testing on components, deliver equipment while we're traveling sometimes, perform buyback inspections or disposal inspections, and we inspect and test collaborative design projects and inspect non-division of equipment purchases. Customers, you're talking on the presentation about your customers. Mm -hmm. Who are your customers? Is it only Caltrans or is it other state agencies in, in California? That's a, a um, multifaceted question. There, there are some equipment that we do have customers that are um, not Caltrans, but they're generally in some form of collaborative uh, design. I think we're talking about tow plows next. So we've been involved in tow plows, um, and some of the customers were UC Davis and and so we've invited people that are not necessarily Caltrans employees, but they have an involvement in the project. Yeah, we do that. And then it goes down to the operator, uh, the supervisor that's going to have to, as you know, operators change all the time. So you have to have a supervisor that's aware of what's happening to make sure they get the new person trained, because you only get the training at the beginning of the delivery of the product. And now, also on that same train, uh, do you actually require the uh, training to be done every so often due to that same situation of your personnel? That, that actually um, is part of contract language. I do know that, that a lot of times, depending on the piece of equipment, we'll actually videotape the training session and then put it on our web page so that if later, after you know, the crew changes, they can actually go look up the training. And of course, we can always pay a vendor to come back out and do the training again. Uh, when you're going to your slide, you got to one point where you said you see all the inspections, oh, let's just get the slide, you have so many steps. What do you have for a process for um, selectively reviewing the obsolescence of certain techniques that were applicable 10 years ago and keeping that list fresh so that you don't keep stacking more tasks on top of it and perhaps things from the older ones behind it? Ultimately, I hate to say this, but a lot of times we don't find out that something's obsolete or out of process until it actually happens. So a lot of times we have a process that says we're going to do this manually we're going to do this, it's now automated. And so when we find something that is now automated, um, we try to update, but the reality of it is, uh, I'll give you an example. Most recently, technology in, in uh, CMS signs, so your, your CMS signs has now reverted to a tablet. Our spec required that it have an umbilical cord with a, with a control head. Guess what our test was? Our test was to test the actual control head. Well, now you have a tablet that does a completely different process. And so now we have to basically, and, and by the way, you know when we figure this out? When we show up. What's obsolete, we no longer test, but that's part of the requirement. So part of the reason we have a specification engineer go with us on these tests is because now we have to add that to that possibility of a spec. That doesn't mean every vendor is going to use a tablet, but it does mean we have to now open it up for that, right? And so a lot of the obsolescence um, we basically find as we go. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation.
More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.